From there, he actually came to New York where he did a spine fellowship with Paul Cooper, who is now retired. And from there, I, I assume you must have uh, discovered your interest in spinal oncology. You went to MD Anderson for two years and actually started the spinal oncology program at MD Anderson. And from there then uh, to Hopkins for 13 years, I think, where you became the vice chairman and the head of the spinal neurosurgery program there. And then obviously that was an incredibly productive time. And, and that's certainly how I got to know you through your incredible contributions to uh, spinal oncology, spinal surgery. Just look at this beautiful rendering of uh, a very complex case. I remember looking at this paper when it came out and uh, the surgical expertise, the judgment that goes into that and the artistic performance, not only of this, uh, uh, of this illustration, but also the actual operation is obviously something that makes you world famous and really made you into, into what you are, which, which is really probably the most famous and uh, uh, sought after a spinal oncology uh, surgeon in, in the world. And then you became uh, chairman about six years ago at Brown University, where you've been now, I think your focus maybe shifted a little bit more, a little bit more administration, but also probably the opportunity from what I understand to really focus actually more your surgical practice on spinal oncology. So, so we have an amazing overview here really over the history of spinal oncology, surgery, surgical and non-surgical management. And uh, you're gonna talk about this evolution. And uh, again, thanks for taking time and thanks for being here with us today. And um, uh, you can take uh, uh, the podium and uh, thanks for being here. See well, you. thank you so much. And I, I'm really grateful for that very, very kind introduction. I've known all the people on the call here uh, for uh, many, many years. And, you know, Paul is, uh, uh, he, he may not admit uh, because he's, uh, he thinks that he's as young as I am, uh, but he has been my mentor from the distance. I've learned uh, an incredible amount from him. And, uh, you know, Rogers obviously has revolutionized the, uh, the minimum basis of spine surgery. Uh, I would say one of the founding members of the, of the field. So uh, their contributions have been felt uh, uh, across the world and be applied, as a matter of fact, some of those into the uh, spinal tumor field. Obviously, Paul himself is a, is a world expert in spinal cord tumors. Um, uh, we just looked at our experience in 2020. We had just passed 5,000 cases at that time of spine tumors. And, uh, but the point of this slide is just to make the, um, uh, uh, the awareness that the metastatic spine tumor still is the bulk of the work, whereas the primary tumors are, uh, are, are relatively rare. Having said that, I'll try to make the argument and hopefully convince you at the end of this talk that the way that we approach these tumors are very, very different. Uh, and hence, it's important to recognize that you might be dealing with a primary tumor, particularly a tumor such as chordoma or chondrosarcoma. Um, uh, the cancer world has evolved substantially since I have been in the field. Uh, we, you know, we don't classify the tumors any longer uh, based on uh, tissue of origin or H any stains that they are geno genomically classified. Interestingly enough, if you look at this paper, for example, endometrial CA, subovarian CA, and breast CA, uh, three different uh, organs of origin and, and uh, cert certain subtypes of these tumors are uh, very analogous as far as genomic profiling is concerned. And they are actually treated very similarly. And so um, uh, this is sort of a, a major shift in the, in the cancer world. Uh, we also recognize that some of the tumors can are driven by uh, specific mutations um, in the tumor. And if you have drugs that could target those mutations, you can really have a huge impact. And just uh, one example of this is uh, a a melanoma. Uh, uh, the BRAF mutation has been identified in a large proportion of melanomas. And if you have a drug that uh, targets this particular uh, mutation that drives the tumor, uh, you can have a huge impact. It, this is a paper that came out almost now a decade ago uh, showing a patient on the left side where you have white the metastatic melanoma and on the right side, you can see after the patient was put on a single drug uh, since this patient happened to harbor a BRAF mutation and you can really melt the tumors away as you've seen here. Our president Carter was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma of the brain, as you know, almost five years ago. He just turned, I believe it's 95 um, and uh, he's still around and, uh, and he's being treated uh, in a similar fashion in addition to serotactic video surgery. Uh, most recently, of course, the checkpoint innovators came into play. This really uh, changed the uh, 
uh, field completely. Even you can take a, can, uh, a patient with a metastatic lung cancer, a, a stage four disease. A majority of these patients really died within months or weeks after they, they were diagnosed with metastatic spine disease, for example. Yet 50% survival of these patients with checkpoint inhibitors now almost 50% two year survival, which is really was not the case when I started the field uh, 25 years ago at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So you cannot really ignore these really um, the transformational uh, uh, discoveries in cancer medicine and talk about the spinal tumors. But uh, I'll take a, take a step back and just give you a case example and how the case example illustrates some of the things that we need to think about uh, when we are dealing with patients with spinal tumors. This is a 50 year old female who's otherwise healthy uh, presents with about three month history of thoracic radicular pain. And the neurological exam shows a mild lower extremity weakness. The patient has a gait impairment, so got thoracic myelopathy. Uh, this is the patient's uh, MRI uh, showing a lesion in the mid thoracic region that sort of extends into the epidural space. And, um, and you can see the reason for the radiculopathy on the left side where left, obviously, uh, the nerve root is, uh, uh, is involved. Um, so this patient had a systemic workup, which proved to be negative. You know, what, what do we do with this patient? This patient has early myelopathy, as you know, symptomatic from this. Uh, do we go and operate on this patient and resect the tumor uh, and reconstruct the spine, which, you know, is it, a, is it an easy thing to do? Um, and we are conditioned to respond to it that way. Uh, but let me let me take a step back and say that we did a CT, uh, potentially a CT guided biopsy of this tumor, and we got one of these four diagnoses. You know, let's say the tumor turned out to be a lymphoma uh, or a breast cancer or a renal cell carcinoma or a chordoma. And, um, and as you can imagine, all of a sudden, how we approach this patient is going to change dramatically. And let me tell you why. Uh, for example, if this patient has a lymphoma diagnosis, we most likely will send the patient straight to chemotherapy. Nowadays, we don't even radiate the site. So the patient goes to chemotherapy and they typically respond to it very well. Lymphoma patients are one of the very few patients where the medical oncologist would come and pick up the person from your floor and will transfer the medical oncologist service because the patients do well and they respond to chemotherapy dramatically and they start the chemo the same night. Um, a, let's say if this patient turned out to have a breast cancer, most likely the patient will be treated with uh, conventional external immune radiation therapy. If this patient turned out to have a renal cell carcinoma, most likely we would do uh, what we call separation surgery. And prior to that, given the vascular nature of the tumor, uh, we would consider uh, preoperative embolization for this patient. Finally, if this patient turned out to have a chordoma, we would think about a more definitive surgery in the, in the form of M block resection. Uh, and if we can achieve that with negative margins. And so it, you can see that the same radiographic uh, appearance and the, uh, you know, the identical patient four different primary diagnoses, and you can see four different uh, uh, major uh, treatment paradigms here as a result of that. Um, uh, the other things that we learn uh, from uh, knowing what we are dealing with is you can prognosticate pre pretty well. So if you say, if this patient like lung cancer, um, this has changed dramatically with the PD-1 inhibitors that I've shown previously. In the past, all of these patients died within four months. Now they live a good couple of years after the diagnosis. If this patient turned out to have a melanoma, again, they used to die within four months and they typically live uh, many years now if they happen to uh, harbor a BRAF mutation uh, or if this patient had a renal cell carcinoma, uh, they used to live for about 12, 13 months and they tend to live now longer because of uh, some of the very um, effective um, uh, uh, anti-angiogenic treatment that's available. Uh, we also get a pretty good sense of how these tumors would respond to external B radiation therapy. Uh, this shows you how uh, these tumors line up. Uh, the very sensitive tumors that you can imagine are lymphoma, myeloma, and small cells of the lung. And then the most resistant tumors are shown on the left side. And somewhere in the middle, we have uh, moderately sensitive tumors, breast, prostate, and thyroid. Um, of course, the uh, vascularity of the tumor can be learned from the knowing the primary. In general, if you have an organ of origin that is very vascular, that tumor is going to be very vascular if it's metastatic to the spine. Um, although we, everybody is familiar with renal cell carcinoma, other tumors you need to remember, uh, thyroid cancer, particularly the follicular variant, tends to be very, very uh, um, the vascular, hepatocellular CA, uh, pheochromocytoma. Uh, of course, anytime you have a name of a hemangioma, the tumor will be very vascular. Melanoma and, and uh, myeloma are both vascular tumors, but they are typically not easy to embolize. So you need to be prepared for a lot of blood loss in the OR. 
we have a whole plethora of options in treating metastatic tumors now. I mean, we have conventional radiation therapy, minimally invasive options, open surgical procedures, stereotactic radio surgery, vertoplastic, hyperplastic, lit procedure, or uh, more definitive uh, operations depending upon the primary tumors uh, to the to primary site. And so uh, given this plethora of options that we have available, how do we make the decision what is the most suitable treatment for a given patient? Um, and I think that the, the, the um, let me go back here a little bit. Uh, I think we jumped a little. Wow, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, here. Um, so we use uh, what's called the NOMSA uh, uh, decision-making frame here. Look at the patient's neurological status, oncological status, uh, whether or not the spine is stable or unstable. Uh, oncological status meaning the primary tumor type, as we discussed earlier, and the extent of the disease. Um, we, uh, of course, now really are adding to this uh, the genomic profiling of the tumor and molecular profiling of the primary tumor as a part of the decision-making because it does have impact both on treatment as well as overall prognosis. Um, uh, Mark, uh, from your, uh, your parent institution here, very nicely described that one can look at the extent of the epidural disease, uh, which serves as a very nice tool uh, to determine whether or not the patient is going to be a, a candidate for uh, serotactic radiosurgery, surgery, as you can imagine. Um, the stability of the spine can be assessed using uh, a neoplastic spine uh, instability scale, uh, spine instability neoplastic scale as shown here, so-called SINs. Uh, not, not so much what the scoring is like, what, uh, but more importantly, what the elements of the scoring system are. I mean, whether the tumor is located uh, in a transitional zone, the better the tumor is blastic or lytic, is there any um, misalignment of the spine, the degree of the vertebral body collapse, whether or the anterior and posterior elements are both involved. All of these things go into uh, decision making to determine whether or not uh, the spine is stable or not stable in a neoplastic setting. Uh, the neoplastic instability is very different than trauma-related instability. Uh, in trauma setting, a lot of the ligaments are ruptured uh, or torn, whereas in the setting of metastatic spine disease or spinal tumors, uh, the, the primary pattern of failure is vertebral column um, um, axial loading uh, failure. Uh, the, uh, the treatment of metastatic disease has evolved substantially over the last three decades. I think it's very good to just look at this journey quickly because we learned a lot of lessons from this. One is, you know, initially uh, we treated everything with uh, uh, external radiation therapy, conventional radiation therapy, when the patients presented with spinal cord compression for metastatic disease. You can see that only a quarter of the patients actually got better when we employed this treatment. Uh, the later surgeons thought that maybe we should be doing a laminectomy, add additional decompression to this. Maybe we can make the outcome better since it was not optimal. But as you can see here, um, uh, uh, again, about the same amount of patients got better. As a matter of fact, we made some of the patients worse because we introduced uh, uh, hydrogenic instability to the equation here and surgical complications. Uh, but the later, the, the, I think the surgeons realized that perhaps the laminectomy was not the best way to approach this uh, because it didn't get to the tumor where the tumor is located, which is in the vertebral body, but also this stabilizes the spine. And hence, if you're gonna do an operation, you might want to think about doing a more definitive decompression circumferentially and also stabilize the spine at the same time. You can see that the overall results improved almost double as far as the neurological improvement rate is concerned. And the first time in the literature, we started talking about improvement of pain, indicating that in many cases, the pain was related to really spinal instability, underlying spinal instability. And, the, and then the later anterior approaches became popular and uh, our group and others uh, published uh, this is transthoracic transcavitary approaches for vertebral body resection stabilization. You can see that the neurological improvement was even better. And so what did we really learn from this, like a 30 years of journey of how the, uh, the treatment really has evolved? And I, I, and I will come back to the serotactic area surgery in just a moment. But one thing we learned is that laminectomy is not the operation that you should be doing in patients with uh, metastatic spine tumors. Uh, number two, we learned that um, the as, as spinal stabilization is an integral part of any spine tumor operation because in many cases, the pain is related to spinal instability, either underlying or the one that you introduce as a result of intervention, iatrogenic spinal instability. 
And then the third, we learned that the more definitive the compression is, the better the compression is, more directed the compression is, better the outcome is, neurologically speaking. And so those are the lessons really we learned uh, from this uh, 30 years of experience. Um, uh, and But when you present this kind of data, the people always make the argument that, oh, all of these are retrospective studies, and you know you cannot really uh, apply this to a patient that walks into my office as a medical oncologist or radiation oncologist on a Friday afternoon and, and say, you know, uh, this data can be applicable to that. And that brings us to this study, now almost uh, 15 years old. Uh, this is prospective randomized trial by Patchell. Uh, determined, really the single question that he was trying to answer, we were a part of this trial by, when I was at MD Anderson. The uh, single question that you're trying to answer here, whether or not adding surgery to conventional radiation therapy is of any benefit. And uh, this trial uh, excluded all the patients with uh, radiosensitive tumors, uh, lymphomas, multiple myelomas, et cetera. And, um, and uh, uh, the patients had surgery most of the time, excellent decompression with stabilization. Many of these patients harbored solid tumors, and then um, they received external beam radiation therapy. And the groups were compared uh, overwhelmingly. Uh, the results were in favor of surgery uh, followed by radiation therapy compared to radiation therapy. The patients lo uh, lo uh, walked longer, maintained their bowel and bladder um, uh, control longer, and as a matter of fact, even they lived longer uh, as a result of the surgical intervention. Uh, but of course, the stereotactic surgery came into play and totally revolutionized the field. Um, and you can see here, uh, not only now we, you, we can use the stereotactic surgery to control the pain very effectively, but also control the tumor up to 90% of the patient, um, indicating that this is really a, 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 a game changer in dealing with uh, metastatic spine tumor. So, Majority of the, even if you look at the tumors uh, such as renal cell carcinoma, that is known to be highly radio resistant by conventional radiation therapy standards, it really responds to radiation therapy beautifully when you use serotactic radio surgery. Um, and hence, uh, uh, this proved that this could be a, a, a primary treatment modality for metastatic tumors. Uh, but we also learned that this was not a panacea. So if you look at the series, for example, from MD Anderson Cancer Center, all of these patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma of the spine, and they were all treated with stereotactic radio surgery. About a quarter of the patients uh, failed the treatment requiring um, uh, surgical intervention. Uh, and when they looked at these patients, why <clears throat> the patients really failed the treatment, noted that this was really related to the aggressive biology of the tumors um, uh, right uh, at the margin between the spinal cord uh, and the tumor in the vertebral body. And, and hence, uh, we were brought back to this concept now, uh, which is the separation surgery. And this is uh, Ilya Lawford and Mark Bilski's work from uh, uh, Sloan, uh, showing that if you were to um, uh, use the radiation therapy in the form of stereotactic radio surgery, if you use very high doses of radiation therapy, you could effectively control the tumor. If the tumor is making contact with the spinal cord, one can really create a space between the spinal cord um, and, the, uh, and the tumor, and you can then administer high-dose radiation treatment effectively and avoid the failures that we have seen earlier, a uh, study that was published from MD Anderson Cancer Center. Hence, the separation surgery concept was introduced to the equation here um, in treating patients with uh, uh, metastatic disease. And so um, if you can take a tumor like on the left side and convert it to a tumor like the right side, uh, then it's much easier to administer very high-dose radiation to the remaining tumor. Now, I tried to simplify this in my practice and try to come up with a simple way of how to determine what the patient needs to have done. And, uh, and I came uh, with this, uh, you have to really ask, I would say, uh, uh, three questions, and we have four things that we can do to the patients. The first question is whether or not the spine is stable. It doesn't really matter what the histology is, how the patient presented. The first question is whether or not the patient has a stable spine. Um, if the answer is no, there is instability, then really you need to address that. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do an open procedure, but you can do a viroplasty, kyphoplasty, a minimum invasive procedures, whatever it takes. The first uh, uh, action is here is really uh, to stabilize the spine. Everything else is, is, is uh, irrelevant. The second question that you need to pose, and you need to pose these questions sequentially. Second question is, is the tumor sensitive to external beam radiation therapy? lymphoma, multiple myeloma, small cell C of the lock, breast, prostate? If the answer is yes, in most situations, you're gonna to go to uh, conventional external beam radiation therapy. 
The third question is, if the answer, you, you know, you couldn't address the two, uh, uh, first two questions, then they come to the third question and you say, well, um, is the tumor making contact with the, uh, with the spinal cord? If the tumor is making contact with the spinal cord, then you really have to create a space there so you can go and administer the sheet surgery effectively. And hence, you have to really do what we call separation surgery here. Uh, so these are the four uh, sort of the three simple questions in, in sequence you need to ask. And then the four things that we can do to the patient that really pretty much takes care of the majority of the metastatic spine tumor patients. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here, look at the primary tumors um, and show me some examples and some contrast in the way that we approach these tumors with some case examples. The primary, this is a list of the primary tumors that we see in the spinal column. And this is not a comprehensive list. Uh, the tumors, this, these are listed from the most benign category to most malignant ones. And the, the tumors that are highlighted with uh, capital letters are tumors that are known to be very radio resistant, radio uh, chemo, chemo resistant and hence uh, they are best treated with uh, uh, complete surgical resection. I'll show you the data uh, to make that argument. The last two tumors, osteogenic sarcoma and human sarcoma, typically require multimodality chemotherapy, but also the surgical resection of these tumors uh, is a, a very important part of the treatment paradigm. So this is the work that we did with AO Spine uh, Tumor Knowledge Forum. I extracted uh, from a large uh, uh, database uh, of uh, 1,500 cases. Uh, these are very meticulously maintained databases of primary tumors from multiple centers around the world. Uh, and we extracted close to 400 patients with chordomas. And you can see, um, uh, and then when we look, when we ask the question, and we have uh, specific data related to the type of surgery performed here and the margins. And we asked the question whether or not the patient had an aching appropriate uh, uh, procedure, meaning that the tumor was resected in an unblocked fashion with negative margins, whether or not it made a difference in the survival. You could see a dramatic difference in survival. And the same question when it was posed, uh, the time to uh, first local recurrence, was there a difference if you were to do an, uh, an aching appropriate surgical procedure? The short answer is yes, it makes a big difference as you could see here. So this is looking at a very large database of patients whose uh, margin status is known and the patient had already been followed for many years. And so uh, this was really a gold mine for us to uh, ask some of these uh, specific questions. Uh, but this really didn't necessarily answer the question in a prospective manner. And this is our experience from uh, Johns Hopkins. When I first went there, uh, in 2002, I was firmly convinced that it's best to treat the chordomas with the uh, block resection with negative margin. We looked at our experience in sacral chordomas, um, and uh, we attempted to resect every tumor in an unblocked fashion with negative margins if there was a first time presentation. Uh, we were able to achieve that uh, in the majority of the patients, as you can see, but some of the patients uh, we failed. Uh, either improperly we entered the tumor, or uh, we thought that we'd gotten the tumor out completely and the specimen margins came back positive afterwards. Um, and you can see the dramatic difference in survival. So this is prospectively collected data with chordomas and kind of sarcoma. So we didn't really, we demonstrated that if we failed to achieve the desired objective of the surgery, those patients typically did not do well. Um, and I'll uh, try to um, uh, make the argument that uh, I hope that I can show you that the way that we approach uh, metastatic tumors versus primary tumors such as uh, chordomas and chondrosarcomas, uh, they are very, very different. In the setting of metastatic disease, our goal is really to effectively palliate the patient, get rid of their pain, maintain their neurological status, and let them go get on their own treatment uh, with chemo, radiation, and whatnot. Where, uh, and the surgical technique typically we employ in this setting is intralesional resection of the tumor, um, and then have the patient go on to serotactic surgery or other types of treatment. In the setting of primary tumors, such as chordoma or chondrosarcoma, our primary objective is really to try to cure the patient or at least achieve long-term survival. <clears throat> and uh, the surgical technique we employ in this setting uh, tends to be very different than block resection of the tumor. And I'll show you some case examples to make these arguments. Uh, this is our looking at our experience with block resection. This is an old slide, uh, probably at least uh, eight or 10 years old now. And you can see the majority of the patients we treated were chordomas, some of the chondrosarcomas. And so sarcomas made the bulk of it, uh, but we did have some uh, primary, I mean, metastatic tumors in there. Met for example, there were about 14 of them. The majority of marine cell carcinomas, they were isolated in a patient who had a kidney taken out previously, and uh, they were doing very well systemically with no evidence of disease. 
Let me come back to this patient. Um, uh, this is a patient with metastatic breast cancer. Uh, you can see the destructive lesion in the upper cervical spine. This patient presented to the emergency room with intractable mechanical neck pain, holding her right up in the emergency room with her hands. Uh, and this M and CT was done. Subsequently, MRI was obtained. Uh, this patient has fairly significant radiographic spinal cord compression, but did not have any cervical myelopathy. The main issue was pain. Uh, but you can see here that the actual issue is more of a deformity of the cranial cervical junction as a result of this destructive lesion. And so for this, we uh, you take advantage of the modern instrumentation, oxygen cervical fixation, uh, plate and uh, you know, lateral mass construct. Um, uh, this is a technique that we use for uh, reduction of the uh, basin and vaccination in the operating room. Um, you basically implant the occipital plate and put the lateral mass screws and attach the rods. And then, uh, you know, you can, you can uh, 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 lock the occipital plates and apply uh, distraction across the cranial cervical junction. The head, head is fixed in the Mayfield head fixator, and you can disengage the, uh, uh, the dents from the skull base, as you can see here. And the, the next one is really translating the cervical spine with respect to the skull base, again, against the head that's fixed to the Mayfield head fixator by using the rods that are bent, as you can see in the image. Um, and uh, now the lateral mass screws are locked, the occipital plate screws are loosened, and so that you can actually translate the rod forward. So two-step process, first, distraction across the cranial cervical junction to disengage the dance from the firm and magnum, and then uh, translating the cervical spine forward to realign the cranial cervical junction. And this is exactly what was done in this case. And you can see the realignment of the cranial cervical junction. We did the laminectomy there, not, not so much for indirect compression purposes, but we wanted to be able to monitor that what we were doing during the surgery uh, by using an intraoperable ultrasound. And then subsequently, the patient uh, was sent and received suture surgery to the lesion in the front. As you can see, we had not touched the tumor when we did our uh, reduction uh, in the operating room uh, and the tumor was treated with suture surgery very effectively. Uh, this is another patient uh, with an elderly woman, 76 years old, who presented with this uh, lesion in the upper thoracic region. It, it, I believe this is a T3 lesion. Uh, the patient is presented with severe interscapular pain, mechanical pain, uh, myelopathy, was having difficulty with walking. The lung tumor was deemed unresectable. The patient received radiation to the lung tumor and subsequently some chemo, but couldn't tolerate it very well. So for this, we've taken advantage of the modern uh, minimum invasive techniques. You know, Roger and others have developed. Uh, uh, these are two tubular retractors uh, using Wilsey approaches, one on the right side, one on the left side. And then we achieved all the objectives of the surgery here. Circumferential decompression of the spinal cord and nerve roots have been ligated. Anterior column was reconstructed with a cage, as you can see here, after the corpectomy was performed through the tubular retractors. And then uh, subsequently, the patient had a uh, percutaneous score placement, as you can see here. Um, and um, had this kind of back at the end of the, the surgical procedure. We were you know, ready to convert the operation to a more traditional approach uh, in this elderly woman, uh, but we were able to execute the procedure uh, using a minimum invasive approach. And this patient really left the hospital several days later and neurologically recovered with uh, significant improvement of her pain. Unfortunately, she died about eight months after the operation uh, uh, with progression of her lung cancer uh, with progressive disease. Um, um, this is another patient who has a very uh, large uh, lesion involving the cranial cervical junction, as you can see here. Uh, this is a chordoma, and this is a very old slide. You can see at least uh, 15 years old now. Um, and uh, uh, this patient presented with uh, progressive uh, uh, neck pain, uh, swallowing difficulty, a CT guided biopsy was performed, uh, and it proved to be a chordoma. Uh, and the type of operation that we are uh, advocating for this, um, obviously, is very different than uh, the uh, previous metastatic tumors that we uh, presented previously. Um, now we can debate whether or not this is the right thing to do or not, uh, and this is certainly open to uh, discussion, but at that time we were convinced it was best to remove this tumor uh, completely, um, and, and this was first approach uh, from posteriorly, as you can see, uh, the occiput and the thoracic spine here, uh, then there's a multi-level laminectomy in the upper cervical spine. Again, the occiput is on the right side of the screen here, and you can see the vertebral artery on the left side, they're dissected, and the same is on the right side. We identified the nerve roots, and those are transected on the right side since they were involved with the tumor. Um, and then uh, we typically place this elastic sheet to separate the tumor uh, from the tickel sac. So when we come during the second stage of the procedure from the front, uh, we can uh, go ahead and um, find our surgical dissection plate. And, and then this kind of instrumentation was performed at the time. Again, you can see how old this slide is because we are using 
uh, wires um, in the thoracic spine and use thoracic screws there in the occiput again it's secured using occipital wires in this patient and then the second stage is performed using a trans, uh, trans uh, mandibular circumglossal approach uh, this is a type of view that we are trying to get here to be able to extract this tumor after everything is freed up from the back and here's the improper picture showing what it looks like in the OR and you can see the edge of the mandible top up top here and uh, this is the patient's the trachea and esophagus here is the uh, retractor retracting that. You can see the tumor here. This is the carotid bifurcation, uh, carotid and carotid bifurcation. Here's the IJ, here's the vagus on this side. And you can see the bottom of the tumor relatively easily. The top of the tumor is hidden under the, uh, the mandible or ridge you can see. So the next thing we do here, we transect the mandible and uh, this allows you to get this kind of view. You can see the uh, important structures across the field, hypoglossal nerve, lingual nerve, and then the, you can get to the top of the tumor uh, and, and extract it, which is done here. And this is the view through the mouth of the patient after the tumor removed. You can see the uh, left vertebral artery, which was preserved, and you can see that right was taken and also the nerve root stumps are uh, seen there. Uh, you also see the close-up view of the carotid there in a, a blue uh, vessel loop. Uh, this area is then reconstructed with a cage as shown here that is cut uh, tall in the front with screws above and below. <clears throat> and this is the artist's illustration showing how this was all put together and the uh, structure that had been sacrificed to achieve the uh, resection here. And this is the patient's uh, specimen as shown here. And this is how it correlates to the MRI scan, <clears throat> as you can see here. So this patient had negative margins and complete resection of the tumor uh, successfully. And this patient lived another seven or eight years after the surgery, unfortunately, uh, died of some other uh, medical issues. Uh, this is another patient, which is really, I would say, one of the most challenging operations that I did in my career. This is a young boy, <coughs> originally from Israel, uh, presented with um, uh, quite a parasis, uh, and uh, emergently operated on uh, in Israel, uh, underwent a multi-level laminectomy. Uh, you could see a little bit of a tumor resected here, um, mainly for diagnostic purposes. Uh, this proved to be a epithelial sarcoma, um, and, um, uh, and this is how it looked like on the axial images. Uh, uh, you can see the tumor, similar to what I've shown earlier, but this tumor is un unfortunately much more challenging. It goes into the spinal canal. Actually, it is intradural here. The spinal cord wrapped right in the middle. You can see it wrapped by the tumor. The vertebral artery is in it. Um, and so with this tumor, um, this young boy, I was communicating with the patient's mother in Israel, um, and I was encouraging them, you know, I don't think that there's much we can do here. Um, and, um, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me, the patient showed up with uh, his mother at Hopkins Emergency Room, and I got a call from the ER and saying that your patient from Israel is here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I go and see the patient, the patient is uh, profoundly quadriplegic. Um, at the verge of being quadriplegic. I talked to the mom. I, I said, I'm not sure if I can do anything here. And she asked me one question and she said, if you didn't do anything, what's going to happen? And I said, I'm afraid she's going to become completely paralyzed and die from this. She said, then go ahead and try whatever you can. And so we actually planned to do a two stage surgery here. We started from the back, <clears throat> this kind of incision, a hockey stick incision to the right side, um, did a multi-level laminectomy. And then, uh, you can see uh, we, the tumor was intradural, as illustrated by the artist here, wrapped around the spinal cord, but uh, did not really infiltrate the tumor, uh, the spinal cord. Um, it infiltrated the dura. I was able to sort of unbuckle the tumor after opening the dura there. And um, uh, as, as shown here, the key to the operation, I have to tell you that this one thing I learned from here, the key to this operation was that I was going to sacrifice everything on the, on the left side. Um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the side of the tumor. But on the opposite side, of course, I need to keep the vertebral artery and I need to be able to uh, move this tumor in the OR away from the spinal cord to be able to mobilize it. And uh, I was able to cut the contralateral pedicles using a bone scalp. Uh, so we were able to do that all from posteriorly. Uh, it's amazing what kind of view you can get when you sacrifice the vertebral artery and the C2, C3, C4 numbers on that side that gives you a very large corridor to get into. And if you cut the pedicles on the opposite side, not the, and if you cut the top and the bottom, which is you know, easier to access than you think it is, when you cut that, then you can actually push the specimen into the uh, posterior fire, pharynx. And that's allowed us to see the dura and excise that. <coughs> and we were able to dissect this all from posteriorly. Uh, came very close to the carotid behind the uh, pharynx, extracted the tumor, 
You can see the spinal canal here. You can develop the tumor that was, this is inside the dura. This is the edge of the dura, which we left with the specimen. And this was an eight centimeter specimen. It was not like a small, uh, a small specimen, which was all delivered through the channel that we were able to create on the right side with the sacrifice of all those structures. This is the patient's post-op CT scan showing really everything from clivus down, extracted all from posteriorly. And this is the patient's reconstruction of that area. We use a lateral, um, uh, uh, use a synmash cage or a uh, fenestrated cage on the right side uh, from the occipital condyle all the way down to the remaining lateral mesh. Uh, but the strength of that cage really came from the fact that it was connected to the construct posteriorly with screws that were embedded into the cage like you would do in lateral mesh screws and that connected to the construct posteriorly. It took three patches to repair the dura uh, to be able to close it. And this is how it looked like in the OR. This is the, the occiput here, and this is the upper thoracic spine. And you are, so you can see our patches here is our cervical lateral mass, screw, uh, mass uh, cage and uh, how it's connected to the posterior construct. This is the patient's MRI scan postoperatively. Uh, this patient did amazingly well. I mean, it just, uh, uh, the next day he was sitting up, extubated. He was sitting up uh, in bed and started eating. And then we got the MRI scan just to, to see what we did. My chief resident called me and said, uh, Dr. Gokasa, this patient is a massive pseudomeningus cell. We have to do something. <clears throat> and uh, But the beauty of this was that we were not in the patient's mouth. Everything was contained. The patient was asymptomatic. No respiratory distress, was swallowing. So I said, I don't think we need to do anything. And it never became an issue. Uh, this is the patient's uh, reconstruction images, as you can see here <laughs> on the CT scan. Um, and uh, just to give you a little uh, follow-up on this patient, this patient is almost eight and a half, nine years out from this operation. Subsequently came to Sloan Kettering, uh, Dr. Wexner there uh, administered multimodality chemotherapy, and uh, we also received stereotactic surgery after that. I had zero faith in this operation, given the histology of the tumor, given the extent of the involvement here. Eight years later, this kid is alive with no evidence of disease, got married, had just second child uh, a, a, about a year ago or so. His, or, uh, his mom sent me pictures of the uh, of the uh, newborn uh, baby. And so it goes to show you, you know, some of these exercises, I, 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 first of all, I wasn't sure there was any role for surgery here. Um, and then above and beyond that, I never thought that the patient is going to be able to survive that long, uh, and, but um, uh, was able to uh, make it happen uh, at the end. I think that a lot of that has to do, of course, with post-operative chemotherapy as well as uh, surgical radio surgery. I just want to show you a couple of uh, other cases to illustrate how we incorporated some of the image-guided technology and interoperative uh, mapping uh, into our uh, surgical treatment. This is a patient I treated here at Brown uh, with a large uh, 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 cervical thoracic chordoma. Uh, this patient was a physician, ER physician, who presented with worsening arm pain and eventually developed right side of the corner. Um, and so we now do a couple of things. One is we do uh, uh, create this tumor, <coughs> print a 3D model of this tumor, real size tumor, and with the critical anatomical structures that you can see here. So we can see in exactly in the OR how this looks like, <laughs> the things that it involves and what we need to dissect. And here it's in the OR, we are using it. Um, uh, uh, this was very helpful in the operating because I told our uh, thoracic surgeon when he was dissecting around the uh, subclavian artery, and he was very timid. And I said, don't worry about it. We are about four centimeters from the subclavian artery. And he says, how do you know that? I said, I know that I'm, because I'm looking at the model and I know exactly where the, you know, the subclavian artery is, which relates to the first rib. Another patient lower down here where we were doing a sacral, a sacral cordomal resection. Uh, these are some of the intraoperative images. Uh, you can see uh, we have uh, a trapdoor exposure here for the first stage of the operation. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this is the type of exposure. Uh, and uh, more importantly, this is the intraoperative CT that we obtain in this patient. I have a reference frame attached to the patient's sternal retractor, or I'm sorry, first rib, I mean, one of the ribs. And you can see that we could superimpose the tumor now. Um, and if Scott, we on the CT scan, you can see how the tumor looks like. Uh, and then intraoperative CT allows us to see how we made the cut. So we are making, we are cutting four vertebral bodies and doing a sagittal osteotomy uh, here. And you can see our very uh, precise cut. And we do this in an image guided fashion. And you can see the tumor on the right side. Uh, this is in the operating room in the middle of the surgery. And you can see our cuts here. I just want to make sure that uh, we are disconnecting essentially the tumor uh, from the spinal column anteriorly to be able to do that. And then we come from the back 
here the, uh, the patient's head is up there and uh, the thoracic screw is lower down here. <clears throat> we then disconnect the posterior part, cut the nervous on this side. I cut the T2, 3, and 4 in this patient. And then including the first, we extract the tumor and reconstruct the spine. Here's a specimen that's uh, res uh, resected. And you can see uh, the osteotomy side here, which is done with a drill, image-guided drill in the operating room. Uh, and we can go across the vertebra all the way down. And uh, this is the patient's reconstructed images in the OR <laughs> after the tumor has been resected, including the ribs on that side. Here are the ghost images of the hardware, as you can see here. Here's another case. This is a torcolumbar uh, cordoma. Again, I treated here brown. Uh, extensive tumor involving at least three uh, levels. Uh, we can print the tumor on the left side, as you can see. On the right side, the patient's MRI scan. Again, we know precisely where, how the tumor involves uh, its subjacent structures. And then uh, we then uh, register the patient in the OR using arrow intraoperative CT scanner, uh, then get the patient's MRI uh, images and fuse them with the intraoperative CT in the operating room and use, use the image guided navigation. So we map the tumor essentially, superimpose on the CT that we obtain in the OR, and we use the image guided navigation and we know where we have to make the cuts. What this allows us to stay outside the tumor all throughout the procedure. I, I can cut, I can literally cut, come five millimeter uh, uh, right next to the tumor here. And I know I'm very precisely stopping and I'm entering the tumor. And the same thing here, anteriorly, I know where the aorta is, for example. I think there's a picture of that. And, and then in this instance, this was a uh, first from we started from the back and then we, we had a combined uh, back and front operation. And now we are really looking through the chest as well as through the back of the patient. You can see the tumor uh, here, extensively involving the, I couldn't even see the nerve roots after the laminectomies uh, right outside the tumor margin there. Uh, we had to mobilize the tumor and we started rolling the tumor away from it. We were able to cut the nerve roots. Here, that's how it looked like from the chest. And then after you extracted that, you can see uh, uh, through the chest uh, there after the tumor resected. And, and these are the reconstructed images. On the right side, you can see now we created a 3D printed image of the hardware along with the uh, reconstruction of the spine uh, and so uh, several things happen uh, with the, applying this type of technology. Number one, we can be very precise. We take the patient in top of uh, a CT, register the patient, navigate, and then they take the pre-op MRI, fuse it, map the tumor, and then execute the operation based on that intraoperative mapping and intraoperative navigation. Uh, this is uh, the last case I think I'm going to show is uh, a patient with a, a lumbar sacral cordoma, as you can see here. This operation was executed in two parts. First one, posteriorly, we did a multi-level laminectomy, dissected out the nerve roots extensively into the retroperitoneal space. There's a thoracolumbar pelvic construct. Uh, we passed a couple of uh, wires here, just for your information. Uh, they're very helpful. These are the tomato saws here underneath the tickle sac, and we passed them uh, ventral to the uh, cord and then tucked them on either side and we will retrieve them from the front to be able to transect the spine. So we, uh, we implanted one at uh, L23 level, another one at the L5 spine level. Here's the tumor uh, and the obvious multi-level laminectomy reconstruction. This is how it looked like in the OR. The patient's uh, sacrum is on the right side. The thoracic spine is on the left side, multi-level laminectomy. Nervous are extensively dissected, all the lumbar plexus bilaterally. So this is the tomato saw here. You can see right here, I'm sorry, right here. And this tomato saw is going to be retrieved from the front to transect the spine. The other wires that we implanted here are going to be used to secure the cage anteriorly. And they are also tucked in on either side of the spine to be retrieved from the front. And this is the second part of the operation as shown uh, by the artist. Midline laparotomy. We are now uh, separating the vessels, uh, aorta, uh, from the IVC, then we go and retrieve our wires, as you can see here. Now we're gonna, this tomato saw, we're gonna use this to transect the spine. <clears throat> and then after we extract that, we're gonna put the cage in, and then the cage will be secured with the wires that have been placed from the, uh, from the back and will be retrieved from the front to be wrapped around the cage. And here's a specimen that's removed. And here is the uh, interior view after the reconstruction with a cage. You can see here, uh, this is the S1 uh, end plate. Uh, the L2 will be up here, uh, aortic bifurcation here, the iliac vessels, and you can see here uh, the cage and then the wire that is in place to secure the cage. <clears throat> this is how it looks like in the, on a the plain x-ray. Uh, you can see the, the, the key to this operation is really to make sure that the cage fit is perfect, uh, because if not perfect, it usually kicks out very easily. 
and then the wires are in, uh, uh, secured here uh, just to make sure that the case doesn't move forward that's because that's the mode of failure um, here. And uh, here's a specimen of it corresponds to the uh, to the preoperative MRI scan. And so, uh, um, so these are some of the surgical cases, some of the regional challenges that we have in addressing these tumors and how we incorporated some of the uh, image guided technology or intraoperative imaging and the uh, 3D uh, printed modeling uh, in planning and execution of the operation. Of course, I don't believe that we're gonna be able to cure all the chordomas with surgical uh, intervention. Um, and so we try to understand uh, how chordoma is formed and there's some of the basic science work that we have been doing related to this. We have you know, identified that the brachyurid indeed, uh, not only just a uh, marker uh, in pathology, but also uh, the driver for this tumor. Uh, there's some of the uh, the uh, early work we did. I mean, this is, I'm going to show you the, some of the experimental work, but uh, brachyurea has been identified um, in familial for forms of chordoma as the uh, duplication of this gene as a driver. This is a transcription factor uh, um, encoded by the T, um, the T box genes. Um, the, uh, the first uh, uh, effort related to this was uh, developing this cell, uh, cell uh, line. Um, uh, and uh, creating an in vivo model for this. Uh, this is extracted from one of my patients, uh, the sacral chordoma patient here. Uh, after seven attempts, we were able to succeed. So this is John Sopkins cell line seven. Uh, that's because of that. Uh, Wesley Sue was one of our re residents who did all this work. Uh, we were able to implant the tumor that actually grow them in, um, uh, in New York mice, as you can see here. We demonstrated that these tumors do express brachyuri um, and they are consistent with uh, uh, the expression of, uh, of, the, of the chordomas. Uh, not only did we show that the brachyuri derives the tumor, uh, but also we demonstrated that if you use small RNA uh, to block the activity of this transcription factor, you can actually stop the growth of these uh, cells uh, in, a, 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 in a cell culture. Um, if you look at uh, more uh, uh, systematically, this is one of the papers that we put together recently looking at a variety of pathways that uh, uh, drive the brachyuri uh, uh, gene and uh, uh, the transcription factor. And uh, you can see all these uh, uh, kinase surface, uh, surface receptors, uh, PDGFR, EGFR, CMAT, and uh, fibroblast, uh, fibroblast growth factor uh, receptor. <clears throat> all these uh, surface receptors through a variety of uh, 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 pat, uh, pathways, uh, some through the uh, uh, RAS, uh, some through the PIK3, um, and some through the AKTM tor, all of these really uh, drive the brachyuri and uh, to tumor. And uh, good news is that we do have a bunch of uh, drugs that are already available uh, to um, inhibit the activity of these, um, uh, or silence the uh, uh, act activity of these overexpressed receptors. Uh, there are also some cell cycle drivers for chordoma. Uh, for example, it has been shown that uh, CDK4 and CDK6 uh, uh, both are involved as the cell cycle drivers and, and uh, overactivated uh, in patients uh, with chordomas. And there are drugs that could really um, uh, 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 modulate the activity of these drivers uh, and available. And he, these are some of the uh, studies uh, or the uh, 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 trials out there. Uh, some of them are targeting the brachyuri gene. Uh, majority of them are vaccines uh, that are targeting the brachyuri gene. Uh, EGFR, PDGFR, CDK, and checkpoint inhibitors are being most recently tried for chordomas. Uh, they tend to serve almost like a radiation sensitizer for chordomas. Uh, so some of the early trials uh, are really encouraging. Uh, this is a, another attempt on our part. Dr. Uh, Chidi Betagawa led this effort. Uh, we looked at the single nucleotide pleomorphism um, in patients with chordomas and their survival. We have identified this as substitution of one uh, single nucleotide in the DNA. Um, and, uh, and some people have this, some people don't. The majority of people have it. So they have a, uh, a substitution of this uh, uh, single nucleotide. So if you have single nucleotide pleomorphism, you do very well. And absence of that actually connotes very bad prognosis that you can see all of the patients died within six years after the diagnosis. So this may potentially be a potential marker for bad actors as far as the chordomas are concerned. Maybe these patients need to be followed more uh, closely. Uh, this is another attempt related to uh, prognosticating these patients. We looked at the 
uh, human uh, telomerase uh, uh, reverse uh, transcriptase uh, promoter region mutations. Um, and uh, I'm not going to bore you with the data, but absence, uh, presence of this uh, mutation um, uh, actually indicated, again, um, uh, a, a, a bad prognosis. Uh, uh, you can see absence of this. Uh, uh, if, if, if the, I'm sorry, the, if the third mutation present, uh, the patient did well. If they didn't uh, have the mutation, uh, they did poorly. And this is some of the related. You can see that presence of the mutation, 100% um, of the patients were alive at 10 years. If the mutation was absent, only 67% was alive at 10 years. So this was also uh, significant between the two groups, indicating that this may also be a potential marker identifying the patients who would uh, get into trouble uh, later in life. Um, and finally, um, I hope that you know the data that I've shown you, some of the case examples, have been able to convince you that we really need to understand the uh, biological behavior of these tumors well. Uh, for metastatic tumors, we have a lot of tools available to us. For uh, primary tumors, uh, particularly chordomas and chondrosarcomas, um, more complete surgery with negative margins tend to uh, uh, lead to a better prognosis. And so I think we have to really make every effort to be able to do a complete operation with negative margins if at all possible. Uh, fortunately, we have seen a lot of advances uh, in uh, spinal instrumentation, uh, various uh, multidisciplinary surgical approaches. So um, it is possible to execute these operations uh, fairly safely. Um, and uh, I cannot really finish this talk without uh, thanking to all of the fellows uh, that I have had the pleasure of working with over the years. You can see going all the way back to my MD Anderson years, my very first fellow was Dr. Ryan's at MD Anderson, uh, and Daryl Forney was uh, another one that I worked very closely with there. And you can see all the Aura Hopkins fellows. Uh, uh, you may recognize some of these characters. John is, of course, at, uh, at Brigham, and Patrick is at USC. Um, uh, and Michelle is, uh, is a professor at Mayo. Ilya just moved to NYU. Chris is at Albert Einstein. Ali uh, just went to Phoenix. Uh, and of course, a lot of the people are at Hopkins, uh, my colleagues there. Before I left, um, and these are some others. Uh, Ali is at UPenn. Uh, Ankit uh, is at University of Illinois. Um, uh, Ali is at uh, 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 in Detroit. Uh, Carlos at the uh, uh, at Southwest, and these are our enfolded fellows from Hopkins. Uh, Dan, of course, is now a chair at Northwell in your neck of the woods, uh, uh, was one of our faculty at Hopkins. Mo is at Hopkins. Uh, uh, Larry came with, um, was a Hopkins faculty, I guess, worked with Paul as well at uh, Columbia for a period of time, and now with Dan at Northwell, and uh, Ben is at Mayo Clinic. And these are our uh, postgraduate fellows from Brown, uh, and we hired some of them. Jared is one of our faculty. Uh, Hashim is at uh, University of Wisconsin. Uh, Michael uh, Galgano is at, uh, uh, at Syracuse in New York. Sean is the Methodist uh, Foundation. Tim is one of our fellows, came from UCLA. And Joaquin is our current uh, uh, faculty. These two are current faculty. They joined us last year, trained with us. And these are our two outstanding fellows for this year. And so I have had over the years many, many you know, outstanding individuals really who made a lot of this work possible. And then finally, of course, uh, these are some of the Hopkins residents. These were not my fellows, but uh, they could have been as well because I worked very closely with them. Dean is at, uh, as you know, at UCSF. Uh, Amir is uh, the chief of surgery at Shriners. Phil is at UPenn as the chief of pediatric surgery there. Matt Lesniak, who was one of our very first residents that I had the pleasure of working with as the chief resident when I went to Hopkins, who was the chair now at Northwestern. Uh, and Jake Schwartz is at, um, at Vanderbilt. And these are uh, my mentors over the years. Uh, Dr. Grossman was my chairman at, at, uh, at Baylor. Raymond Sawai was my first boss at, uh, uh, at MD Anderson. Uh, Henry, of course, my first boss at, uh, at Hopkins. And uh, Paul, uh, Gordon Angler, and Tom Eric are the people that I was trained with uh, at NYU. Uh, with that, I'll stop there and see uh, if there are any questions uh, that the people might have. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing there. Zia, thank you so much. What a tour de force over uh, evolution of spinal oncology and the surgical and treatment, uh, but also what an amazing career and, and uh, what a wonderful legacy uh, you left behind with your fellows and the, uh, the residents and who all, you know, have amazing positions now. Thank, thanks for your for your you know very thorough presentation. Are there any any comments or any any questions? Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Gukasman, for just a, a truly uh, in-depth and, and broad overview of, of your approach to these tumors. I was interested in, in knowing how the advances that we've seen in proton therapy and some of the improved efficacy and outcomes that we've seen have changed your approach to chordomas and perhaps changed some of your, your surgical decision-making. Well, I think that the, the uh, you know, looking at some of the work that's coming out of uh, Sloan Kettering and also uh, more importantly, some of the uh, results from uh, Germany and uh, Japan and other places related to using carbon ion uh, radiation for chordomas, uh, uh, they look very, very promising. And so uh, what really uh, that allowed me to do, uh, I would say, uh, I still uh, uh, do firmly believe that a complete resection, as complete a resection as possible, uh, and if possible with negative margins, it still should be the goal in treating uh, certain types of primary tumors, particularly chordomas and chondrosarcomas. Uh, but then, of course, you look at what, at what price you're going to accomplish that objective. And if the I, I became more conservative, shall I say, sacrificing nerve roots and other structures to achieve that objective. And so I do a, as complete every section as possible while preserving function, as much function as I can. And then, and then I feel more comfortable now knowing that these patients can be more effectively managed with adjuvant proton beam radiation therapy or serotactic radiation surgery or, uh, or uh, carbon ion radiation if needed. Uh, in certain cases, if I do believe that the patient, I cannot achieve the surgical objective, and if all the patient has a lot of comorbidities, I don't have any trouble sending this patient straight to um, uh, proton beam or carbon ion radiation. Uh, interestingly enough, I, I, I'm just going to be operating on a patient, uh, of, of, uh, Roger Hardell's, uh, the day after tomorrow. The patient just showed up here today, got admitted to the hospital. He had treated the patient urgently at Cornell five years ago. Uh, the patient presented with a pathological C2 fracture and a tumor, a Jewish gentleman, and, um, and did, we did a beautiful job. The tumor turned out to be, which you know, he didn't have a choice. The patient was quadriplegic near when he presented over there. So when, after the surgery, the patient recovered beautifully. The pathology came back as the differentiated chordoma. I had seen the patient five years earlier, and, and the patient really was not in very good shape, medically speaking, and Roger had done a, such a beautiful job, and I said, at this point, I think what you need that is a proton beam radiation therapy. And he went ahead and got that. And this is a diff differentiated chordoma with residual disease five years later. So they never had any issues, never had the follow-up. Five years later, he showed up here with a, a massive progression of the tumor at the verge of being quadriplegic. So I'm operating on him on Friday. Um, and we've got to do a palliative procedure just to the compress the cord and make sure that we can buy some, some time for him. Uh, but it goes to show you that, you know, sometimes the, 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 these types of therapies can be very, very effective. And I think that one of the reasons perhaps it responded so well is because it was a more de-differentiated tumor rather than, you know, more uh, uh, classical variant of the cordoma. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Zia, maybe uh, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, uh, the incorporation of of some of the uh, technologies such as you know navigation and uh, augmented reality and so forth, do you, do, you, do you think that adds to your surgical ability and, and the surgical ability going forward to perform these operations? Uh, to be honest with you, we yeah, we don't do these surgeries without that anymore. It's, 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 it is it is it is habit for me when you when you bring that technology in the operating room, being able to do a CT scan in the OR in the middle of the case is incredibly powerful. Being able to, you know, point to something and know exactly what that is and how it relates to an adjacent structure is incredibly powerful. And I, I uh, when you know, I am not an early adapter of the, you know, image guided navigation in the spine, and I was tra trained in a traditional way, and we did a lot of things with anatomical landmarks. I, I, I used two X-rays to place screws and all that. Uh, and uh, but I so I, I felt like a you know I, I feel like a dinosaur when I see what's happening in the operating room and and I probably am a dinosaur and so now really our residents you know we be when we operate we look at the surgical field right our residents operate looking at a at a screen that's how they operate um, and sometimes I need to say whoa 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 the spinal cord is there you know because they're not looking at the they're not looking at the surgical <clears throat> field anymore 
Um, having said that, I've also seen the evolution from uh, from uh, using image guided navigation in the OR for cranial case. When I was at MD Anderson, it was just coming out when I was a junior faculty. I was trained with no image guided navigation. So we could really you know, look at the head, know where the tumor is, and you could do your craniotomy and extract the tumor. And it was like, I said, why do we need this technology? I can do it much faster. I know where it is. I don't need to, I don't need to have a tech. And then after you start using it, you, you ask the question, why, why did we not have this 10 years ago? Uh, and so they, they, that's where I am exactly. When I walk into the operating room, if we, I don't have the image guided navigation, the arrow CT scanner, everything is set up. I don't, I, I don't, I feel, I don't feel comfortable anymore. And the tumor is mapped. And so we know exactly because it, it simplifies the operation so much. And a lot of the anatomical knowledge that I had to learn to do execute these procedures safely is not that relevant anymore. I'm right. sad to say that, but it's not that relevant because a, a person can look at point and know exactly where to put the things on, where to put the things on. I mean, I, I suspect a lot of the things you do in the operating room are not the same as you were doing 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Is that correct, Roger? I think it's disconnected. I think he might be frozen, yeah. Yeah, I think it's frozen, yeah. as well or six six thirty or something like that is that correct no i think uh, uh i don't know rupa what what's the time frame yep so uh after this whenever we're done here with the q a we we will take a little bit of a break and then if you have some time the residents from columbia and cornell uh will be meeting with you and just uh, discussing some of their cases so so very much very much look forward to that very much look forward to that mm. All right, see, I, I'm sorry, I missed your last comment uh, about- I was, I, I, was, I was saying that I, you know, uh, uh, how we incorporated all this uh, technology into surgical uh, procedures, 